Good evening. My name is Nikki Monsey Acosta, and it's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Olumiyamesi Nisi Abolade. Professor Abolade is an accomplished professor who was recently appointed in 2013 as the Vice Chancellor at Tessaloran University of Education in Nigeria. Prior to this distinguished appointment, she was the head of the Department of Continuing Education at Abafame Obololo University. Professor Abalade received her Bachelor's of Education degree and a Master's of Arts degree in Adult Education from the University of Ifa. In 1992, she completed her PhD in Adult Education from Abafame Obololo University. She has received business education certificates from Harvard University Business School and from Cambridge University Judge Business School in 2004. Additionally, she has received a certificate in resource mobilization from the Ghana Institute for Management and Public Administration in 2008. She is an International Women's Federation Leadership Foundation Fellow and an HER South Africa Grant Fellow. Professor Abalade has over 33 years experience as a university lecturer. Over the years, her research has enhanced the field of sociology of adult education with research findings designed to strategically assist policymakers, educational planners, administrators, and other stakeholders. She has over 35 publications in leading academic books and journals. And she has been an external examiner to, to the University of Ghana, the University of Ibadan, the University of Lagos, and the University of Guinea. Professor Abalade has attended and participated in over 40 conferences and workshops at the national and international levels. She is a member of several professional associations and organizations, like the Nigerian National Council for Adult Education, International Sociological Association, and the Adult Education and Poverty Reduction Network, to name a few. Professor Abalade also applies her vast knowledge and skills to address individual, <coughs> national, and global developmental needs. She has been a hands-on researcher, trainer, and consultant. She was a member of the consulting team for the development of a gender policy for the Nigerian police force. And she is currently a consultant on a project addressing the root causes of gender-based violence in southwestern Nigeria. Finally, Professor Abalade is happily married to Professor Titi Ola, and they have um, they've been blessed with wonderful children and grandchildren. Please join me now in welcoming our keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to start by thanking the organizers of this conference for inviting me to speak about something that is very close to my heart. The title that I have chosen is Reclaiming Our Identities, Culture, identity and informal learning in Africa and the African diaspora. Today, I attended a session and I realized that we really needed to have this conversation. In one of the sessions, as Africans and the whole continent, we barely escaped being awarded costs to pay to our oppressors. The Europeans who came to Africa, who came to Africa to devalue what we stood for, were discharged and acquitted. And the victims were made to feel guilty. We need to look back at where we come from, where we are, so that we can plan for where we want to be in the future. There is a proverb that my people would normally say. 
that when the rain is beating you, you must take stock. You must look back at where you're coming from. Look at your present and think of looking at where you want to be. It is time. Some of us have found that thank you very much for this thing. It is something that we need to talk about. Now, I start by saying that issues of identity cannot be treated in abstract. That is because they are very often, when you talk about identity, the public becomes the personal, and the personal becomes the public. It's usually very emotional, doing a thorough research on identity. A lot of the time, you tend to also situate yourself within the context of your research. And so most of the time, there is a felt need to be at the heart of it, to better understand it. Some of the things that I'm going to say may be considered contentious. So I want to start by saying, as we say in my country, it's no vex so. <laughs> Don't be angry. The beauty of an academic treatise is to generate powerful discourses and passion, not passive indifference. So bear with me. When I receive passive indifference to things that I see, it doesn't make me happy. It doesn't flatter me. I need to be challenged so that I will know that at least people listen to what I said. And so what are we thinking of doing around this topic? First, to examine identity and identity issues around Africa and the African diaspora from a cultural perspective. To highlight those factors that have impacted greatly on our culture and on our identity as Africans, either within or in diaspora. To pull together the arguments around culture and identity within the framework of education and learning. And to consider the implications of all this for the future and make suggestions for the way forward. And the first question that comes to mind is, why is the discourse around culture and identity so pervasive, so prevalent, so heightened, so much on the front burner of global social and intellectual discourse? It's because we are drawn. It's because we have found ourselves in a cul de sac, in a very unpleasant situation, because things are falling apart. Apologies to Chino and Chibi. It is because the consequences of our previous apathy are now before us, on our doorsteps. As my people back home will say, it is right there on our doormat. And because of this realization, that unless we make urgent sense of the current situation, the future is bleak. We need to make sense out of the air now. There is violence in the land, terrorism, kidnapping, corruption, crime, widespread indiscipline. Where did we lose it? Where did we go wrong? Where did we lose our cultural values? Where did we misplace our identities? Where did we move away from the ancient landmarks? How did we get here? And I submit by saying that the violence in the land that we see are the byproducts of our collective failures. They are the offerings of the culturally confused youths, the disemboweled and ruthless, the dislodged, dismembered, and fragmented identities. The ones who do not belong anywhere, who are not sure where they are. On the streets of many African nations, people fight and kill themselves when Asna and Mayu are the pitch of football. And you ask them, 
Just point to the way to the UK. They don't know. They see themselves more as foreigners, even in their fatherland. These are the ones taken over by persons who market other strange cultures to them to influence the construction of the negative culture and identity, which results we now see. How did we get to a point where our youth will be so hopeless, so ruthless, so disenchanted, that they will be ready to blow themselves and others up? How did you reach this level? When we were growing up, I remember, there were poems that we were taught to celebrate the sanctity of life. There were poems that taught us character, that taught us to value humanity, the collectiveness that made us who we were. Where did we go wrong? What happened at all? And so our culture, our identities, when we're looking at it, I had this shopping list to interrogate the dominant discourses around African and African diaspora culture, the identity and identity politics, especially with respect to the activities of the colonial powers. To examine the implications of this for persons in the process of deconstructing, reconstructing, co-constructing and reclaiming their identities. To force all issues surrounding African identity into the open arena, to politicize them if need be, and undertake conscientization thereof, we need to wake up. To examine what all this portends for learning amongst African and African diaspora communities. And so we'll be looking at some salient definitions of culture and pulling this together within the context of our topic. And so we'll be situating culture within a contextual framework of identity and learning. In relation to identity, culture refers to the values, the symbols, the interpretations, and the perspectives that distinguish one people from another. What are the things that make us African? It is the shared knowledge and skills created by a set of people for perceiving, interpreting, expressing, and responding to the social realities around them. It is that complex whole which includes knowledge, beliefs, arts, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits required by a human as a member of society. And so, it is seen as a social construct. A social construct that presents the ability of human beings to know, to perceive, to understand, and to be aware of self in relation to self and others. And so, what are our thoughts around these definitions when we look at culture as a social construct in the context of identity? What is our culture expected to do? For us, the African culture is expected to provide the enabling grid for promoting, for nurturing, for strengthening social ties and cohesion amongst communities. Is it doing that? It is to enhance the development of individual and communal self-esteem and well-being. Is it doing that? It is to promote the reality of interdependence among the community, the principles of collectivism, and the philosophical spirit of Ubuntu the recognition that we are what we are. The individual is what he or she is because of what the collective is. I am what I am because of who we all are. An unbreakable code of humanities to others, 
a universal bond of sharing that connect, connects all humanities. One which confers the uniqueness of our oneness and interdependence. That word encapsulates the essence of African cultural values, the ideas of reverence for human life, of mutual help, of generosity, of cooperation, of respect for older persons, and the preservation of the sacred. I grew up remembering in my village that when people wanted to build houses, they didn't have to have much money. They only had to. They only needed to have friends, to have neighbors, to have families. People would come around and they would use the mud and they would build houses. First for A, another time for B. All you had to provide was the meals for those who were working. What happened? Where is that spirit of helping each other, of seeing ourselves as part of a larger world? If we look at culture as learning, it defines as a conscious, directed cultivation of the human thought and the collective programming of the mind, which distinguishes the members of one category of persons from another. It speaks about a configuration of the learned and shared behavior of a community of interacting human beings, as well as the results of such learned behavior, with the component elements being translated, shared and transmitted by the members of that particular society through communications to the minds and to the memories of the present generation. What values, what culture, what identity are we transferring to the minds and the memory of the present generation? And so our thoughts around this, Culture and the context of learning thus transfigures into a social consciousness constructing, a social cons consciousness construct, in being recipients with the human ability for knowledge, for percep perception, for understanding and awareness. And so, that culture is socially rather than biologically determined and transmitted. And therefore, for us as Africans, our culture should serve, if it is not yet serving, as both a symbol of identification as well as a process for learning towards social consciousness and sustainability. It represents or should represent the totality of our thoughts and practice by which we as Africans and as a people create ourselves, sustain and develop ourselves, and introduce ourselves to history and to humanity. There is one thing that we cannot run away from, and it played out today as one of our sessions. Conversations around African and African diaspora culture throws up passionate political debates and analysis. Why is this so? Because the question of politics is indispensably inherent in the event of culture. Dominant powers want to assimilate and take over a people and destroy their culture. Because in destroying their culture, they're able to destroy their identity. And in destroying their identity, they are able to remove them from the roadmap of the future. And so we're looking at African culture, colonial imperialism, and religious territorial powers. And I say a bit of the innocent. I am not a professor of history, but in my first degree I read history. And it always amazes me when I go through the history of the African continent. Why we were so unfortunate to be visited by persons who just came to rip us apart to destroy our legacies, and to destroy our economic and political structures. 
And I brought out some salient facts that the logic and policies of colonialism was antipodal to African culture. That the colonial imperialists and the religious territorialists, Christian, Muslims, they came and they pursued their goals with total indifference to the interests and concerns of Africans. The emphasis was on acquisition and retention of power for economic, political, and social cultural exploitation. And they could be termed social cultural vampires. They represented at that time, like I said, what could be termed social cultural vampire. They operated from a position of economic and military power and they came with an attitude of superiority. They deliberately dismantled the cultural underpinnings of our society as Africans by setting up a middle class of African pseudo-Europeans to talk to challenge the status quo. And these people were encouraged to commit cultural suicide. If you look at our history, during those periods, you will see people in the sweltering sun, three-piece woolen suits, <laughs> and they will be sweating, even now, on the streets of our cities. In heat that will boil water, people are still putting on ties and all this, in the, you know, because they want to be seen as culturally correct and civilized. Everything about our religion, everything about our food, everything about our clothing, everything about our language had to be devalued so that as a person it would be easy to assimilate us. I could remember that when I was in primary school, they would put a notice. The vernacular cannot be spoken. <laughs> Speaking of vernacular, <laughs> is punishable by. <laughs> For a long time, I didn't understand what was going on. Now I know. We were made to believe that it was only the politically, the socially, the culturally correct that spoke Queen's English. We lost the ability to speak. Our, our children no longer speak. I grew up in a community where I was able to mix with my grandparents and the elders. And that is why when I talk now, I think better in my mother tongue. And when I talk, when I'm passionate about something, I speak to them, and I use a lot of proverbs. And people will say, ah, ah, did you go to school to learn these proverbs? I was fortunate that I had the opportunity to go for holidays in environments that are not church. My use of language as a very of my culture. How many of our children speak our mother tongue, our language? Talk less of being able to use proverbs. Hmm? And you remember the same. Proverbs are the power with which we are. So we give them yam, we do not give them the power. And we complain that the yam is choking them. Why will you not choke them? What are the consequences? Many societies were here to a social cultural disarray. And these people, along with many others in generations to come, lost their cultural compasses and became cultural exiles within and outside Africa. You know, when you want to go out and you put on a royal duba or you put on an African attire, they look at you and say, Where are you? What do you think you're going? Well, there's something. You know, I, I have a friend, whenever she wants to go to a wedding, she has to go and shop in a boutique. And she will come back with an evening gown. And, as, and I, I keep telling her, this is not even correct. We are neither African nor European. 
<laughs> or you both don't wear evening gown to weddings. So, you be which one? Which one are you now? Are you African or are you European? If you want to be European, then go and take some lessons because this is half knowledge. Even after the colonial era in Africa, some people still prefer to the, refer to the Europeans as having brought civilization to Africa. And this thing gets me very upset. So they brought, the Europeans brought civilization. Even persons of my generation still speak like that. Many Africans and scholars of African history and culture have expressed some exasperations at attempts by oppressive colonial powers to reinvent African history and culture through distortions. They point out that African culture was, you know, these scholars have to point out that African culture was neither invisible nor a dead end. We had a living culture. They posit that civilization actually started in Africa and that Africa had, before any other race or continent, an existing body of knowledge, skills, and practice with a disciplined way of developing and transmitting the same to generations. We were not culturally poor. We had a culture, a thriving culture. Where did we miss the road? What happened? How will the child of the butcher start eating the bones of the cows? And so we looked, we have spoken about Culture, identities. We say culture and identity are intricately interwoven because a major part of a person's identity is related to his or her culture. But culture is a historical reservoir and is important in shaping identity. And that the totality of our thoughts and practice by which Africans as a people, as we create ourselves, sustain and develop ourselves and introduce ourselves to history and to humanity is part of our culture. In the social context, identity could be defined as sameness and continuity. The totality of the package that makes a person to self-identify or to be identified by others as part of a social group or community. It is the distinctive characteristics belonging to any given individual <coughs> or shared by all members of a particular social category or group. In a psychological context, identity is defined, I mean, defined thus. A person's identity is defined as the totality of one's self-construct, of how one constructs oneself how one constructs oneself in the present expresses the continuity between how one constructs oneself as one was in the past and how one constructs oneself as one aspires to be in the future. Therefore, a person's ethnic identity is that part of the totality of one's self-construct made up of those dimensions that express the continuity between one's construct of past ancestry and one's future aspirations in relation to ethnicity. When I want to encourage my children to reach for the sky and to be the best, sometimes I will call them and I will, Pro, what is you? Or you go for Ricky? <laughs> the press, the, 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 the lineage press me. And I will call them, I will say, your, your father has did this. Your father has did this. You are the, you are the daughter of so, 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 so. Who went to war and did this? Who did this and this? Who built this? Who did this? And I say, so you can do it. If your father has did that. If the generations upon whom show, upon whose shoulders we are standing can do it, you can, you can move the extra man. You can do the impossible. How many of us remember the praise name of our own lineage? Talk less of using that to encourage our children. 
the generations after us grow up believing that they're second class citizens. They rather aspire to what Europeans define as a standard. And yet we had a standard. We had persons who did wonderful things. We had persons who fought wars. We had persons who brought back laurels. We had persons who were economic leaders. <coughs> what happened? Identity refers to the capacity for self-reflection as well as the awareness of self. There are certain issues that I consider important that we should know. Identity is multidimensional and multi-presentational. It's not just a one-dimension photograph. As I stand before you, I stand with my multiple identities. And I must be able to reconcile those identities to be able to function properly. I'm not just a woman. I'm an African woman. I'm not just an African woman. I'm an African woman professional. I'm not just a woman. I'm an African woman professional, a wife, a mother, and a Yoruba person. Multiple identities. Our children are not able to reconcile their fragmented identities because we do not even understand our own identities ourselves. We have dominant and subordinate identities. Depending on your location at a particular time, an identity may be dominant. And at another location, it could be subordinate. When I'm in the office as the vice chancellor, my identity, some parts of my identity are subordinate for me to be able to function. When I'm at home with my grandchildren, another level of the identity becomes dominant. I must be able to balance it so that I don't start behaving like grandma in the office and behaving like Madam Vice Chancellor. <laughs> Our identities are multidimensional. If we don't do a good job of reconciling those identities, we will be in trouble, and generations afterwards will be in trouble. There are collective versus personal. When I look around the social strata now, we have lost a lot of the collective identity. It is me, mine, and what is it? And, and the personal. Sometimes we go to places where people are praying. Nobody is praying for the neighbor, nobody is praying for countries. Bless me, 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 me. We have lost the identity of the collective. The things that brought us together as Africans, that brought cohesion to the African community. Inter versus intra identities. There are inter identities even within Africans, within communities of practice. And intra identities even within, within the same community. There are derived identities. When I, you know, that's why I say identity issues are personal. When I was going through this, I remember that, ah, yes, we used to have people in my language who would be called Baba Smith, Baba Kadeta, Baba this, Baba that, derived from their profession. And they became their identity. You will not even remember their names or anything, just Baba. This, I, it's, it's difficult to translate. I cannot say father of Bruce Smith. There are some things that it just comes better in the vernacular. There are natural identities versus constructed identities. Natural present and birth. 
constructed identity acquired through nurturing. Yes, I am a woman. Because biologically I was born a woman. But what other identities have been constructed over and above the natural identity? We should know that persons could self identify or the identity could be constructed by others and imposed on him or her. And we are going to look at the implications of this later. You could actually self identify, but others could now construct an identity for you impose it upon you, and we will see what happens when that is done. Identity formation or through identification and association with significant others. And sometimes I am sorry for our children. They go to school in a car, they come back in the car, they come to first world prisons called houses. Mm. They do not even know the names of their next We went to school where we knew each other, where we could play with each other, where we could bond, where we could relate, where we were able to see ourselves as members of a community, where we were made to realize that the survivor of the individual is dependent on the survivor of the community. Our children don't have that noise in now. It's just the immediate family, the nuclear family. And the word nuclear is good. When we use the word nuclear to refer to that family structure, it is actually a time bomb waiting to go. And how do others see us? Or how do others want us to see ourselves? Let's look at the favored core values about how we see ourselves as Africans. If you look at our lineage, our origin, the way we pictured ourselves, the way we saw ourselves as Africans, as persons of value, intelligent, confident, strong, bold, <coughs> courageous, humane, persons who have respect for elders, who have respect for the family and lineage name. Persons who are compassionate and communal. Now, how do others, how, what identity do they give us? They rather give us identities that disempower and disable us. Because these are identities that preserve power, the power that is used to dominate us. And so we are labeled selfish, indolent, dishonest, disrespectful. Persons with criminal tendencies. Is that who we are? Unfortunately, many of us believe and continue to believe the lie. Why? When you tell a lie, often a lot, people begin to believe it's the truth. So when the media, when all the forms of media, all the forms of interaction, when they keep telling, persons, that these are the characteristics, the identities of Africans, and they keep retreating the dream, they put them to start believing it. And so somehow, we buy into the lie and we cooperate with our oppressors. Also, and this is rather unfortunate, Many persons who shape our mode opinions and lives in Africa and the African diaspora today, they serve anointed experts who constitute themselves into cultural gatekeepers, appear to have insufficient knowledge and understanding of our traditions and culture. Unfortunately, they are the Sanibats. This is Senegalese word that connotes throwing a voice. They are the ones who speak for us. They are the ones whose voices are loudest. They are the ones who hold the television, the media. They are the ones whose voices are recorded. I was uh, I do some I do some gender training, and we were trying to mobilize women for political leadership. 
And one of these so-called leaders of thought was so angry. I said, mm -hmm. women are not supposed to aspire to leadership. I bagged it up with the yoga. You know there are modern programs that involve part of the And said, the little of the river to Asia, I told to Ariri, if they are a little good. If they are a tree, it's a tree that gives us, that gives us an obnoxious odor. So when a settlement is to be created, you first destroy the area tree so that people can breathe fresh air. And so he likened a woman aspiring to leadership to an area tree growing inside the compound. And you know, a lot of women say, hey, hey, that's why we don't put ourselves up for electric post. That's why I'm allowed him to finish. Because you see, knowledge is power. If we do not know our history, our culture, People were going to cheat us on the first And I said, sir, where did, how far back did that proverb go? And he looked at me. I said, because in history, there were female alarms. There were female colonies of the All the kingdom had its own female colonies. Even the Owa of the traditional. No female lineages. I said, the last. Another fear of yours, the female alarm was on a bottom ring. And he looked at me, I said, Yes, go and check. Go back home. I said, So when the colonial masters came and they fed us this thing and we bought into it, we lost the power to unless the skills, the knowledge of 50% of our population, and we decided to go to women down. Because that was what was going on in the England of that time when they came. Has any of you ever wondered? I come from Yoruba stock. And I remember that in Yoruba land at that time, two of you will remember, when people have business, big businesses or this, they will not say Mrs. Mrs. Anabi or Mrs. Ajao's shop. Mm. It will be Batili Alake. It will be Sanawa Abeni, it will be Bintu Abeni, it will be the first and the second name. They were not ashamed to lay claim on the products of the work of their hands. And they were not ashamed to let people know that this was what belonged to them. <laughs> Nowadays, if you put Bintu Abeni, people will say, ha, ah, maybe she's not married to her. Maybe she's not cheap, you know? But those were, we, we had strong women in Africa. We had women who were also part of the team responsible for the survival of the race. Where did we get that idea that women were fit for leadership? Who sold us that idea? How did we buy into it? Such that now, those peculiarities, those strengths that women could bring into leadership are lost to us in Africa. There is also another double, double jeopardy that those who know better keep quiet. And you remember, for evil to thrive, it takes only good to keep quiet. And so, reclaiming our identities, the revisiting of the African traditional educational system, and deliberately tie this topic to our educational system. Because unless we revisit our educational system, it will be damaging and we We are talking of traditional versus colonial. I equate formal education to colonial education, and traditional to the informal. And how do we distinguish them? First, by the market space where the instruction is provided. Where does it take place? By the clientele. Who are the persons? By the goals and objectives of the teaching learning process. <coughs> by the flexibility of the subject matter in focus. By the period and timing of the learning. 
by the location of the controlling hub of the teaching learning international. And this is very important. With formal education as brought in by the colonial imperialists and missionaries, the center of control was with them. They are located to themselves superior intellectual parts. And so for them, they were bestowing education on an illiterate community that did not think for themselves, that had the ability to think at a lower level, at a pedestrian level. By the basic assumptions implicit in the goals and objectives, we go on. What are the features of the formal education? It was institutionalized. It had to take place in spaces designated for the purpose. So a child had to leave home in the morning to go to that designated place. It was bureaucratic. It had to be. Because you were not permitted to really think for yourself. You see? A thinking person is a dangerous person. If you do not think, you don't even visualize a person. But if you think, you are dangerous. It was rigidly controlled. Even now, in the Nigerian educational system, the universities are, so, are supposed to be really beds of intellectual discourses and research and innovation are straight-jacketed by the, by the controlling agencies. In Nigeria, is a national university commission. You want to take a step, they tell you no. You see in our book, you want to do this, you think it is relevant to our current need. They say no, there is no benchmark. <laughs> the BMAS is, is like, uh, an only book, <laughs> you know, there is no benchmark. I have to tell them what I say, then create one. <laughs> we see a need, we want to move into it, you say there are no benchmarks. Create one. Who we'll continue to hold us down? We must think outside the box. But those controlling institutions, relics of the structures put in place to stop us from interrogating issues and environments are still there. We are not allowed to think outside the box. It is curriculum driven, very rigid curriculum. This step leads to this, leads to this, leads to this. When you want to do the house, must be this and this. Even if things change, mm -hmm. you still have to do it that way. Then you complain later. It is hierarchically structured and non age group. And it is recognized with great diplomas or certificates. Informal. It's experiential. You experience it. You go through it. It's incidental and structural. It's non institutional learning. The construction, co construction or acquisition of new knowledge, understanding skills or attitudes, which people undertake, whether consciously or unconsciously, is what we call informal learning. <coughs> Why are we talking of? informal education because it is suitable, tried, and tested. It is flexible and available. It is needs specific. There's a particular need and it meets the need. It is relevant and realistic. It is it takes care of everything and it is lifelong from the cradle to the grave. You never stop learning in traditional society. It has immediate application. The concepts, ideas, and delivery processes are part of the daily lived experiences of the learners. It takes place within the location is familiar everyday environment of the learner. The language is a mother tongue. It has the capacity to serve and connect with the community. It is participatory and interactive. At different stages in life. The instructor becomes a student, the student becomes a instructor. Nobody has a monopoly of this time. When we say it is participatory, even in the in the courts, the courts of the ancestors, that can be considered as 
the tertiary institution of traditional society. It is still participation. They will ask a question, you will respond, and on and on and on and on. He believes in the educability of every individual, so there were no dropouts. You have to be part of the training. There were no dropouts. Now we have a lot of dropouts. Again, why are we talking of informal education? Because all educational provisions are value laden. How people learn, what they learn, who teaches what and to whom it is taught, is of critical importance. Let no one deceive you. There is no educational activity that can be politically neutral. It's important that we keep on meditating on this. And so, if we have a formal education that was more or less important, what in? How can we use that without amending it, without adapting it? How can we just use that alone as a building block to our future, to our desired future? So what is the way forward? There must be a creative engagement with our traditional education. We must blend our traditional education with whatever can be salvaged for formal education. We must sit down together. This is how we learn best. This is how it used to be. This really served us. Now you brought this. We are forced to now have a marriage of this. But it must be a marriage suitable to our own realities and our own needs, not for support. So we must evolve an educational package that is both transformative and emancipatory. This is Emancipatory and transformative. We want to change attitudes. We want to change the present so that we can have a better future. We want to reach back into our past to correct the mistakes we have made in the present so that we can have a structure that can lead us to the future. We have to look at making our education transformative and emancipatory. We have to break the umbilical cord that ties our sons to the English football La Liga and all this, you know. Asnac, Chelsea, Man U, all those things, we must break the umbilical cord. There was a time when it was uh, shooting stars. It's all shooting. I'm sorry, you know. I, I love football. Just, you know, the passion was for our local sports. Now, they know about Baka, they know about, you know, every, ask them that they know what happened. We must severe them. We must be focused our youth. They must learn to value what is ours. What is ours is ours. And what is ours should be cherished. And what is cherished should be nourished. And what is nourished should be preserved. We cannot continue to throw our culture and what is ours and throw it on the ground for people to march on. And then we say we want to be together. I beg, where are we going? Sorry. We must develop an educational package that facilitates creativity instead of repressing it. We must develop an educational package that is able to create the requisite synergy between living and learning. So, what are the ways forward? I have, I'm trying to time myself. And uh, this is where I think we need to take some action. Well, thank you for convening this. And for each and everyone who has been part of organizing this conference. But well, believe me, we need to have a roadmap for action emerging from this conference. It is something we need to consider seriously. There is an urgent need to facilitate a coming together of intellectuals, of practitioners, 
of strategic stakeholders and of cultural gatekeepers in an integrated, I didn't use collaborative. The way you collaborate, you just join hands a little bit, it can break. When it is, you see, when you put palm oil inside gari, it is difficult to separate. But when you put a bowl of palm oil and a bowl of gari, and you're just putting a little at a time, that's what time you may decide. But once it is properly mixed together, it becomes permanently mixed. The integration, not just the collaboration. We must bring all these people together in an integrated interdisciplinary partnership in the real sense of the world to undertake the following. We are planting for the future. This is the first one. We must bring people together to examine, to discuss, to analyze, and interrogate the present formal and informal education with a view to pulling out the best of each integrating our African traditional ways of teaching and learning into the formal education package, and synthesizing both with a view to involving a responsive educational package to tackle perceived social problems. Attention was paid to assessing how much of our informal knowledge is reflected in the formal education curriculum. If little or not, how is this to be addressed? We must pursue vigorously the vertical and horizontal integration of the new educational package. Vertical in the sense of encouraging the realistic, lifelong learning of both children and adults. We, we behave as if we, we educate children separately and educate adults separately. We fail to realize that what a child collects and brings from home, socially, intellectually, or everywhere, in part on what that child is able to make out of the formal school name. We forget the home. We forget the building block of the home. We leave the parents within their own school. We concentrate on the child. The child comes back from school and goes back to that same environment. It is important that we do a vertical integration. We must always remember that different generations are related to each other in learning. We must also do horizontal integration in the sense of integrating learning in school and learning in everyday life. When you tell a child, A for apple in Africa, and the child has never seen the apple, <laughs> it's an abstract concept. <laughs> yeah. Don't you have fruits? in Africa. Does it have to be apple? How many teachers have seen apples? But you say, A for apple. The child say, A for apple. I was born up before I saw apples for the first time. And all my life, I was taught A for apple. Even when I go to my village and my grandma would say, what did you, what did they teach you today? I say, a for apple. See, <laughs> apple. Some of us didn't have a concept. <laughs> My grandmother, until she died, never saw an apple. I saw an apple when I was grown up. And so I couldn't make a thing. If you had told me an orange, there were oranges in our backyard. Why did it have to be apples? What point are we trying to go? And so we must integrate learning in school and learning in everyday life. They must link, they must shake hands. They are not two parallel lines that never meet. Because the personal and the public combine together to make a holistic group. The child from the home and the child in the school, they are still the same child. The child comes from home to school, it's still the same one child. And so you must bring that child together, the personal and the public pursuit for the holistic We must examine the role of the social media and the entertainment industry as vehicles of formal, non-formal, and informal education. What messages are these ones passing? 
Africa is wicked, evil, dark, unfriendly. You know, when I watch some films, a young man is wooing a young girl, and they have to go to uh, KFC, Mr. Beats, McDonald's, whatever. Nobody goes to the read bookers. <laughs> In our streets, Fano Wale, all those. I know some very good ones. Nobody goes. What programs are our children watching? The cartoons that our grandchildren and our children watch. What stories is being told to them? What values is being passed across? And we don't say, oh, don't disturb me, go and put on the television. Yeah. You know? When my grandmother, when my granddaughter is trying to be playful, people say, go and put on the cartoon, go and watch. One day I sat down in the sitting room and I saw. <laughs> and I said, is this what this? This morning I was challenging one of the participants. I with your knowledge of A and B, why don't you create cartoons for African children and mm -hmm. speak to our realities and our values mm -hmm. and see if some of us will know why? Why do we have to go and export and import cartoons that do not speak to our realities, that do not pass across the values? Why would I want my little granddaughter watching cartoons where they are shooting each other, stabbing each other, killing each other? Is that African? Does it reflect our values? Will somebody please develop cartoons and speak to our realities so that our generation, the generations of the future, will learn about our history and our culture and be able to revive our values and develop the right identity to move the continent forward? Formation of a standing committee that can meet in the virtual if we be and serve as a central hub for all the other committees and groups. The standing committee is expected to serve as a coordination point for social and intellectual exchanges between Africans on the continent and those in the diaspora. And I was telling somebody yesterday that if there are Africans in the diaspora who wish to spend some of their time in my university, we will be happy to have you. Come back home the listening. should develop programs to attract and administer funds for the project. And I said a special committee must be set up to revisit the HP Commission report for the JP. There is a session of that report that we missed out on. It recommended the setting up of either a department or an institute of cultural studies. And it said it should be for research into our culture and our tradition, the things that make us Americans. It's for Nigeria at time. It was to be a central hub for knowledge generation and dissemination about Africa. Today we're arguing about our history, about what we were doing, what we should be doing. We're arguing about how our stories are being told wrongly by the Western world. That concept should have solved the problem. What did you have? We just had something that looked at like a department. It was supposed to be an integrated multidisciplinary unit, reaching out to other African continents. That's what we should be looking at now. What are the histories, the cultures? How do we want to reduce it into packages that our people can interface with, our children can interface with. We must set up a social media site to tell our stories, to tell our children, go to www, whatever it is, or not go to this and you will see the story of this person, this person, this country. 
our children now learn to be blind straight. When I was in the university, we had some European history for yeah, this we are this I used to hate that course. I couldn't just answer. I couldn't identify with it. And I was like, really? I will read it, I will pass what I have graduated and I can't remember much about that. But I remember Nigerian history. I remember the history of uh, South and Eastern Africa. I couldn't. You know, sometimes I sit back and I said, For two years I did you that. What did I learn? <coughs> Very big. Nobody sat down to tell me about the history of my people. It is just because I have grandmothers who believe in passing on the history. Otherwise, I would have been lost and witness. I happen to be the first child, and they made sure I never forgot. Because my grandmother will say, you are the continuation of the lineage. I must never forget. She will call me and tell me the story of how my grand grand grandfather came and said, and I'm telling you this because when I sleep and I rest with my ancestors, somebody must be able to pass on the lesson. And she will say, you are the continuation of the lineage. You must never forget. That is why I never forget. Now, beyond rhetoric, ladies and gentlemen, out of this conference must emerge concrete roadmaps for action. It is important. This is something that I want you to meditate on. The project of selfhood and identity invites us in some to demonstrate the possibilities buried under what projected projected, imported, imposed cultural values has deemed impossible or inconceivable. To secure ourselves and enact our identities and liberated in this requires bringing to the cultural surface what lies buried beneath its institutionalized sedimentations. In lieu of seizing those challenges, we can remain queued up in the lines of society's matrix of domination. We can remain what the dominant oppressive cultures have named us, rather than what we name ourselves. The final article. Ladies and gentlemen, always remember, we are Africans. We are proudly Africans. We are Africans not if. We are Africans not when. We are Africans not because. We are just Africans. We are not Africans in name only. We are not Africans in their words. We are people of a proud race with rich history and culture. We are not ashamed to self-identify as such and to be so self-identified. We have no apologies for this. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Well, for those of you who have been paying attention you will notice that we have a large number of women scholars. Yes. This is a revolution. Yes. And I have a speaker, a formidable woman intellectual, as the president of the university, speaks to trends in Africa that people are not taking notice of. And like in the US, we now have black populations of women in universities. In fact, as we now track it, just as here, we now have some universities where we're collecting this data uh, in terms of number. And some of us are beginning to pressure governments in Africa that we want to know the number of women in engineering, in medicine, and that if this number is not satisfactory, we have to begin our kind of making aggressive demands. And that because of the linkage between women empowerment and development, we are very grateful for this initiative that is ongoing. 
and major universities in Africa, Legon, Makare, Ibadan, you and I have to be pressuring them to produce women vice chancellors because they have <laughs> consequences. We have to do this. Yeah, that the place like Legon University of Ibadan, rated 19.8, have yet to produce women vice chancellors is very shameful. I must begin to do something about it. When she attended our conference many years ago, she was not the university president. And this conference, we are blessed that they come and they become successful. Professor Nico is here. She used former vice chancellor. Used to be used to attend our conference. We became vice chancellor. We have vice chancellor from Sokoto University of Abuja. Yakub. Professor Yakub is here. See ya, is it uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, and we, we thank all of you. Celesta was a keynote speaker last year as we looked at back to Africa as the president of American University in Nairobi, Kenya. So we're having some of these um, exchanges that will continue to, to empower us. And tomorrow, we are going to collaborate two awards in honor of two African women. We're going to be having an inside award, and we're going to create an award in honor of Ondari Matai as part of our contribution. <laughs> Let me now make a closing remark. Whether in the spirit of the lecture, I will follow the lecture in my closing remark. And I will borrow a story, which we actually have here. Uh, Professor Ben Linfors is here, who was the Dean of African Literature for many years. And he was able to create um, a, a, one of the best collections in the country. We have the, all the original papers of the most Mosutrola uh, here in our uh, campus. Uh, but I want to use the story to make comments on this great lecture. And here is the way he must to allow post this story. He talks about this beautiful girl in this city. And everybody wanted her. And she would say no. For so many years. She said no. And on this day in the marketplace, a handsome man came from nowhere. Not a part of the village. Nobody has ever seen this man. And the man approached her, and she said yes. And without the man being in dowry, visiting the girl's parents, she decided to follow the man. A quarter of a mile into the forest, the man said, my wife, look at me, remember. This hand, I borrowed it. I need you like this. <laughs> Out and my wife, this right hand, I borrowed it. He put it off the land. The leg, he removed it. The second leg, he removed it. I became a kukute. I demanded this. This head I'm going to remove. I never wanted to cry because I don't want to. He said, It's too late. It is too late. The really has folklore, but it's a story of globalization. Mm. Africa, this is the computer, take it. This is the electricity, take it. This is the car, take it. And at any time it suits them, they will withdraw it from you. And like that wonderful man who came into the city and the woman does not understand, Africa becomes the bride that was misled. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen.